Good morning, and thank you all for joining us today. I'm Joan Palaszczuk, Acting Deputy Director of the Foreign Service Institute. It's my great privilege to introduce today's Heroes of U.S. Diplomacy program, which on honors Jenkins Vangen for his heroic, courageous work during the Second Liberian Civil War in 2003. Since September 2020, the Heroes of U.S. Diplomacy Initiative has shared stories of historical and modern day heroes who have displayed policy, moral, or physical courage while advancing the State Department's mission. These stories shed light on the unsung contributions made by past and present members of the Department of State's Foreign and Civil Service, as well as locally employed, employed staff. I'd like to recognize Brooke de Montluzine and U.S. Embassy Monrovia colleagues who brought today's story to light. They drafted the nomination of today's honoree, Jenkins Vangen. Today, we are honored to recognize the selflessness and courage that Jenkins demonstrated during his country's Civil War years and the all-out effort he made to aid his country and support the U.S. mission in 2003. Among his many contributions during this difficult period, Jenkins worked around the clock to assist American citizens who were trapped in their homes due to the fighting. At great risk to himself, Jenkins traveled under the cover of darkness to physically collect and bring them to the embassy to be evacuated to safety. For this and everything else that Jenkins has done for the American people, we are very grateful. Thank you to our participants, audience, Jenkins family and friends, our representatives in Liberia, Ambassador Michael McCarthy and Deputy Chief of Mission Allison Grunder for joining us today. I'd also like to extend a very warm welcome to our colleagues and friends joining us remotely from U.S. Embassy Monrovia. I'd like to thank the Una Chapman Cox Foundation for its generous support of the Heroes of U.S. Diplomacy Initiative. Thanks in particular to Ambassador Lino Gutierrez, Executive Director of the Foundation, as well as Cox Trustees, Ambassador Catherine Canavan and Larry Wood for joining us today. In addition, I'd like to thank our partners in the Bureau of African Affairs for joining us to bring, it, to bring this deeply moving story to life for today's program. And finally, I'm honored to welcome today's speakers. U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, will share her experience working with Jenkins when she served as U.S. Ambassador to Liberia from 2008 to 2012. From the Bureau of African Affairs, Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs, Belinda Jackson Ferrier, will provide additional details about our honoree. She also will introduce Jenkins Vongen and retired Ambassador John Blaney, who was the U.S. Ambassador during the Second Liberian Civil War. And now, it's my great honor to turn the program over to Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield. Thank you. I'm not sure that Ambassador uh, uh, Thomas Greenfield has been able to join us. Uh, apologies for this. So perhaps uh, we can turn this now over to Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary Belinda Jackson Ferrier. Great, thank you very much. And uh, you know, welcome everyone to today's program. I wanna thank you for being here today to celebrate the contributions of Jenkins Wangen during the second civil war in Liberia in 2003. A particularly warm welcome to staff watching from Embassy Monrovia, as from, and thank you very much for joining us. As the war unfolded, the country was overtaken by violence that resulted in over a thousand civilian casualties. At the time, Mr. Vaughn was a locally employed staff member serving in the political and economic section at US Embassy Monrovia. There, 
He courageously supported the mission through the most challenging of circumstances. During this time, Jenkins worked to identify American citizens who were trapped throughout the city due to the violence. He traveled undercover at great risk to physically collect and bring them to the embassy. Amid violent encounters and shortages of basic necessities, Jenkins also assisted in coordinating logistics for the embassy's repatriation and evacuation efforts. Above all, Jenkins worked closely with political officer Dante Paradiso to negotiate and draft a unilateral ceasefire and withdrawal statement for Liberians United for Reconstruction and Democracy, rebel forces. This ultimately convinced them to depart from Monrovia and allowed peace talks to resume. Before I introduce Jenkins and Ambassador Blaney, I see that Ambassador uh, Linda Thomas-Greenfield has joined us and I'd like to pass the baton over to her to speak. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Belinda, and uh, thanks to everyone. I apologize for uh, for being late, but I really wanted to be here uh, to be uh, with uh, Jenkins. I, I'm just so honored uh, to uh, be here to honor him uh, and to be one of his colleagues and to call myself a, a, a friend. For anyone who has ever worked in Liberia, Jenkins' name is kind of a household word. It is so associated with um, it's so associated with the U.S. Uh, embassy, and it was so associated with the success of the U.S. government in, in in Liberia. And I just want to take one moment to commend uh, Jenkins for his extraordinary work, his extraordinary effort, his extraordinary commitment to the US government during his years of service and uh, particularly uh, uh, highlight his courageous uh, uh, work during uh, during the war in Liberia. And finally, I want to thank Jenkins family. Uh, I know that they sacrificed tremendously while he uh, worked uh, to carry out his responsibilities uh, for the US government. And I just want to say to all of you, thank you. I want to say to all of you how much we appreciate Jenkins. And Jenkins, I know you have so much more uh, in your life to achieve. And we all look forward uh, to watching your success as you move forward in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador, for those comments. And we appreciate that you were able to join us today. So now I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce Mr. Jenkins Vangen, who dedicated over 19 years of service to US Embassy Monrovia, where he worked for several US ambassadors to Liberia and Chargé d'Affaires. Much of his service was during Liberia's civil wars, which lasted 14 years, ending in 2003 and costing nearly 250,000 lives. These were very difficult and dangerous times. And when Jenkins retired from the US Embassy Political and Economic Section, he was involved in US initiatives to support Liberia's recovery. He has continually shown his dedication, selflessness, and unwavering courage to support the US mission, Americans abroad, and initiatives for Liberia's economic and social recovery. Next month, he's also starting a fellowship at Harvard University's Kennedy School. I will now pass the virtual baton to retired Ambassador John Blaney, who served as US Ambassador to Liberia from 2002 to 2005. He will interview Jenkins and help share the amazing story of the actions he and a handful of US Embassy Monrovia personnel took to secure peace in Liberia and facilitate the removal of Charles Taylor from power. Thank you, and Ambassador Blaney, Mr. Jenkins, Vangen, over to you. Well, thank you very much for having me today, and uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. I want to welcome everybody viewing this as well. Um, you know, uh, Jenkins served Embassy Monrovia for 17 years outside of the time that I was there. So I just thought I would mention that many of these points were difficult and dangerous as well. And for those reasons alone, that qualifies him as a true US hero of diplomacy. 
But in addition to that, during my time as ambassador, 2002 to 2005, Jenkins played a crucial role in ending the 14 year civil war in Liberia and really stabilizing much of West Africa. Let me explain. Let's go to the map. Can we go to the map? No. Um, there we go. Okay. Uh, now, by mid-2003, the war was reaching its uh, climax. Uh, two rebel armies, Lurd and Modell, were marching quickly towards Monrovia, and Lurd laid siege to it. Hundreds of thousands of civilians had fled the fighting, and over one million people were trapped and crammed inside Monrovia itself, with the rebels pressing, uh, pressing hard to take the war downtown right amongst them. Uh, food, water, medicine, well, really everything was cut off by the siege, which lasted many weeks. Now, you can see in this uh, map uh, the lured axis of advance coming north to south, the orange line, and then also they were, they were attacking from west to east. The embassy itself is, lo is that blue circle you see on, uh, on the map uh, located by the Atlantic Ocean. What you can't see is the second rebel army which is pressing uh, from the south, moving from the bottom of the map, outside of the range of this map, northerly. So they completed the encirclement of Liberia. So sometime, at some point I determined in, in, around June that I really had to return from uh, the formal negotiations in, in Ghana because we were concluding these ceasefire arrangements and they were being broken constantly and repeatedly. So the negotiations themselves were failing. Uh, and I thought I might as well return and see what I, I could do on the ground. Um, and somehow when I got there, I realized we still had to facilitate Charles Taylor's departure because many people had, had, had urged him uh, to leave Liberia and step down from power, but he was still there. So that was job number one. We also had to really stop the fighting uh, from going downtown before it turned into a bloodbath and an endless struggle for power. And finally, we had to prevent the breakup of the nation state of Liberia itself, which was failing. And that would have ricocheted and cascaded into an entire failed region in much of West Africa. Uh, and it would have been an incubator for international terrorism. Another part of this complex situation was dissuading most of Washington not to close the embassy. Now, I'm not talking about drawing down. We'd already done that several times to a skeleton force, but I'm talking about completely closing the embassy and uh, letting all this bloodshed and chaos take place. Um, we were the last functional embassy uh, operating in, in Monrovia at the time. And of course, it naturally became more and more difficult for me to make the argument to stay as the embassy itself came under bombardment by heavy mortars. And we took thousands and thousands of incoming machine gun rounds, uh, much of it from nearby battles, some of it directed. And very unfortunately and sadly, we did take casualties. So this is precisely where our honorary comes in. Every day I had to have accurate information about all aspects of the situation, uh, about uh, Taylor and his gunmen, what were they doing? About the rebels, where, where were they? What were they going to do? Uh, about um, the humanitarian situation, which was desperate and getting worse. And of course, as was mentioned earlier, what about Americans who were still in Liberia and trapped? What do we do about that? And then of course, there was our own security as well. To be sure, there were others who gathered and pooled this invaluable information with Jenkins, uh, Colonel Suan Sandusky, Master Sergeant Ferguson, Dante Paradiso, our great RSOs, our superb Marine detachment, who heroically guarded the embassy, and there were very, very few of them for a long time. Um, 
But as a librarian, Jenkins could go beyond the walls and gather and contribute to this type of granular information that I needed to decide what to do next. He also helped me with that other problem that I mentioned, which was, uh, which was um, um, not only implementing our agenda, but trying to make the case back to Washington that we should be allowed to remain. Um, I had the advantage of tactical information, thanks to uh, Jenkins and others, and Colin Powell uh, would call me on the phone and he would quiz me about, uh, ask some tough questions about why we were still there and, and everything else. And, and really he was gathering information so he could fend off pressure, uh, including from Donald Rumsfeld, uh, uh, and make the case that we should be given more time to solve this complex uh, crisis. This argument went all the way to the top, right in front of President Bush at least three times. And it resulted in the most acrimonious exchanges between these two men, uh, Secretaries, Secretaries uh, Powell and Rum Rumsfeld during the entire Bush administration. Um, it was about Liberia. It was not about Iraq or Afghanistan. Uh, though that's where the most, most of the sparks flew. That's where the most argumentation took place. Now, if you want to read uh, about the rest of this and what took place, you can read Dante Paradiso's fine book. It won the gold medal for best history book in 2017. And it talks about the stand we made in Liberia and, and the success we had. In sum, throughout all this, Jenkins, worked nonstop and heroically uh, to, uh, to serve Embassy, Mon Embassy Monrovia, but also to save his country. So I think at this point, it would be appropriate for me to ask him to join us. Jenkins, uh, how are you today? I'm fine, Ambassador Blaine. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone. Great, great. Uh, I, I, I have some questions for you to start us off, and then we're going to take some from, from the audience. Um, well, you know, uh, you did great things. I hope I did some justice to them. Um, but, you know, no one starts out as a hero, and no one starts out as an adult either. Tell me about young Jenkins. Uh, tell me about uh, growing up. <laughs> well, uh, firstly, before I start, I just want to thank... Uh, Ambassador Lena Thomas Greenfield for taking time of a busy schedule to uh, attend this program. And I know Ambassador Elder is watching. Uh, thank you for, for, for coming. Ambassador Blenning, thank you. We did a great job. Well, uh, I grew up in a small mining town of Yekepa in northeastern Liberia, where I was born. My father was uh, a mining truck uh, maintenance man, and my mom was a small trader. She sold uh, basic goods in the market. Uh, there are six of us, three boys and three girls, and I'm the eldest. So I grew up in Yekepa and uh, I came to Monrovia in 19, the first, for the first time in 1987 for vacation. So all my life has been centered around Yekepa. I went to school in Yekepa and I knew nowhere else except Yekepa. And while growing up, I saw uh, what shaped some of the things that shaped my opinion was uh, as a boy growing up, I saw my father uh, held at gunpoint and and severely beaten, you know, in front of my mom and my brothers, because his only crime was he came from an ethnic group that was the same ethnic group as uh, cool makers. So that shaped my opinion, and that shaped me into uh, uh, the kind of work I did. I, I've always wanted everybody to have uh, equality, everyone to be equal and no, no one should suppress, repress, or oppress anybody else. So here we are today. Good. Uh, if, if I can ask, before our time together in 2002, what, what was it like to work at Embassy Monrovia? Did you ever think that maybe it was time to, to leave and play it safe? Well, yes. At some point, I thought that uh, I should leave because you know, it was very dangerous. And I felt that it was not worth it because uh, the warlords were not willing to lay down their weapons. But again, uh, because of my orientation and my thought, 
I feel that no Liberian should die because a few men want power for their own personal benefit or personal gains. So I dug my heels in and said, I'm going to be the sacrificial lamp to help save my country. My, my countrymen, my compatriots do not deserve to die because certain people want to shoot their way to power. Great. Let's turn to the climax of this Liberian civil war and your role in ending it. Well, we both know that Charles Taylor fought his, fought his way to power and, and his regime was the epicenter of violence in West Africa. Um, and yet your job was to keep me and others informed about their actions and intentions and uh, get the views of many others. As I increasingly confronted the Taylor regime, how did this affect your going out there and doing your work? Again, I mean, it was, it was a very hard work. It was difficult. Uh, I was labeled uh, with all kinds of tax. Uh, I was uh, marked for elimination. Uh, I was very treacherous. It was perilous and it was dangerous. But again, I was committed to helping save my country and its people. So at some point in time, I just went with the flow. I said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to help save my country. I'm going to help save my people. There is no reason why a few men should think that they uh, should rule the rest of us uh, at, the, at, the, at the point of, 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 of guns. So I just put myself into it. And, and, and here we are today. Mm. Yeah, here we are. Um, we're, how worried were you that we would actually uh, have to close the embassy as the other diplomatic missions had, uh, especially after the, uh, the rebels began attacking Monrovia, the embassy was bombarded and Taylor's fighters became more and more out of control? I was really worried, especially uh, when we went to our country team, team meetings and you know, the, the kind of language that came from the meeting. Uh, then Defense Secretary Don Rumsfeld was determined to, to shut down the embassy when he ordered the three warships off the coast of Monrovia, the Iwo Jima, and, and the other three, the Kiasaj, I think, and one other warship. So, and I didn't want a, a repeat of, the, of what happened in Rwanda or in Bosnia, I didn't, because it was going to be a, a massive uh, genocide. It was going to be one of the worst atrocities in human history. So... I, I, thought, I told myself, I said, I, I could live with the Americans today, but what happens to my country? What happens to my people? So I just thought to make myself the sacrifice and do everything I can. And I'm very happy and very grateful that uh, you listened to me. Uh, we were, you were able to push uh, Liberia's case in, in Washington. And through our collaborative effort, it wasn't just me. So it was because of you, because if you are not pushed, made a case, I mean, all my efforts would not, would not have uh, uh, come to fruition. So uh, I just made the case and I'm so proud that I was able to save my country and save thousands of lives. This is what, I've, what brings immense satisfaction, immense joy to me. I'm happy for that, that I was able to well, save thousands of my countrymen and women. It should, it should. Um, let's, ha let's talk a little bit more about, as the war came right into Monrovia, uh, um, we badly needed information from outside the walls what was it like to move around and talk to the fighters? Uh, can we get a look at one of the fighters, uh, please? Show him what individuals he would have to deal with. There we go. Dapper, yeah. young, dapper young man. Uh, what was it like to, to, to go out there and get information? It was, it was really dangerous. It was really, really dangerous. And like I said, uh, at some point in time, I didn't care anymore about uh, my own uh, life because I just wanted to see the people of uh, my country live better lives and, and be saved. So it was really dangerous. At some point, uh, at checkpoints, they knew me and they would mark me and they said, we're, com we're coming for you and yeah. we're gonna get you. They even went to my home in Gardnersville and, yeah. and ransacked my entire home, shut up uh, my dogs, you know, and, and looted my, my home. And, and, and my neighbors sent me word that don't, don't even come here because if you come here, if you came here, you will not you know, be able to, to go back. So that was when I, I dug, in, dug my heels in and, and stayed in, in my office at the embassy for three months. I was working and living and doing everything in the embassy where I washed my clothes in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a sink. So it was pretty dangerous, but I yeah. just managed to, to, to thrive just for the sake of my people. Yeah, it was. Um, what about those American citizens that were talked about earlier? Um, I sanctioned you and Dante Paradiso to go out and locate them. 
which was challenging and to rescue them. What were you guys thinking as you would go through these gunmen uh, and, and child soldiers uh, unarmed to try to locate these Americans who some were trapped behind rebel lines, as you'll remember, and, um, and get them back to the embassies so we could evacuate them uh, by helicopter? You know, I will give Dante more of the credit because, I mean, I was born in Liberia. And in fact, uh, I come from the same region as uh, the a bulk of Charles Taylor's uh, uh, forces from Nimba County. So for me, I could blend you know, uh, easily, but Dante was the, the braver one. Being you know, a white man uh, and coming into town with me, moving about sometimes under the cover of darkness, it was really, I, I, I was scared for him. But again, we just, we just play our trade. And Dante and I, used to go around before, I mean, the war hit, Mon came to Monrovia. We used to go to play soccer. So uh, he, he knew a, a lot of the people in town. He, he was well-connected also. So we just used our, our, our skills, the skills you taught us and our skills from FSI. So we just uh, navigated uh, the situation very well. I hope everybody can appreciate what I'm talking about when I said granular information. This is what you're hearing about now. Uh, okay. To end the war, I led a small U.S. and Afri West African convoy across no man's land to negotiate with Commanding General Cobra. But afterwards, I realized that we badly needed a kind of a, a, a focal point uh, to conclude the war. So our resident lawyer, Dante Paradiso, in consultation with you, wrote just such an instrument. And then a, a group from the embassy crossed no man's land, got the rebels to adopt it and, and, and my proposals. And then you and others went everywhere working tirelessly as our eyes and ears and voice for implementation of it and its intent by all sides. You know, this is risky business. Uh, tell us about th this experience of trying to stop that war. So uh, after, um... Dante told me about, you know, Jenkins, can we put something together uh, like a ceasefire? I was, I was like, well, I mean, <laughs> the, uh, we, we, I mean, I can do it. I can, I, I mean, I can take it on. So I spent the, the whole, the entire night in my office behind my computer, you know, drafting something. So I put uh, the agreement, the framework of the agreement together. And the next morning I passed it on to Dante and Dante is a lawyer, you know, by training. So he looked at, right. he, he, he saw the things that I couldn't see and we worked on it and we present, I think he presented it to you and you looked at it and you, you made a ding, very dangerous uh, uh, foray onto uh, Boucher Island, you know, to see General Cobra and uh, Sharif and, and all, the, all the other the fighters. And we were able to stop the war. And I just want to let people know that this, the ceasefire agreement we drafted was the framework for the comprehensive peace agreement that was eventually signed in, in, in Accra uh, in, in, in for, to end the war in, in, in Liberia. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, well, that document, just to give the elements there, it was, it, 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 was a, it got a real ceasefire. It got a withdrawal by the rebels to where I wanted them to go to the Po River and allowed the African peacekeepers to serve as, an, as a buffer force in between the various combatant armies. And uh, as, as Jenkins just said, this was the end of the war. And that this is what allowed the negotiation of the comprehensive peace agreement in Ghana to conclude later on that had been stuck. So you played a very important role in that victory. Uh, I'm curious to know though, you know, you can walk, you could walk among the people. They've been in a war for 14 years. What, what was it like to walk among the people when they, when they began to realize that this war was finally over? Well, uh, having set up, uh, set out with a goal and achieving that goal and seeing the thousands of people throng the streets, rejoicing and celebrating, it was also one of the happiest days of my life because at least uh, I was able to help and contribute my, my uh, abilities and my, my, my skills to avert a very dangerous uh, situation, atrocity. And seeing the people in the streets, I was so happy and I actually cried, you know, and yeah. I, I, was, I was so happy that I was able to help save, save the lives because with the rebels, the, the rebels were, were 
force to overrun Monrovia. I mean, as as you know, the, the the bridge was, and it was it was only because of the intervention they did not even actually come to Monrovia. So, and I knew what was happening. I knew what was at stake. If those rebels have have crossed the border, or uh, have crossed the bridges, have crossed the bridges, the two bridges to enter Monrovia, and the, and with Model coming from uh, Grand Bassa County, and with Taylor's forces sandwiched, it would have been an untold bloodbath in the history of mankind. And I'm happy. To, that I was able to help avert that situation. Well, I, I think we're all happy. I think we're, it was, it was a great moment. I remember it well. Um, and I remember also that later on when I returned to the States, President mm -hmm. Bush told me he was very pleased and, and Colin Powell thought it was all fantastic, but added, you know, I wouldn't try that one again. <laughs> what's, what's your reaction to that? I think I would also uh, like to add my voice to uh, retired General Powell's uh, voice. Don't try, don't do that again, Ambassador Bellini. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Uh, tell me about. Let's go a little beyond that that period and talk about the post-war situation. I mean, after all, it was still pretty tough out there, right? And uh, uh, what was it like working with the UN and and, and with Jock Klein, with who headed it? What was that like? Oh, uh, you know, um, except the four start for the disarmament, that was the only thing uh, that, that had been uh, afraid. But we had to push push on to, to consolidate the gains we already made because we didn't want the war to, to restart. So right. we worked with the UN very well. We helped with the disarmament process. We helped build uh, state institutions. We helped strengthen the, 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 the peace. And we eventually helped organize uh, transparent elections that saw the election of uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf as Africa's first female president. And right. we also um, organized several other elections that uh, uh, brought the second term of uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf again. And now we have uh, President Josh Weir. But um, there's still a lot to be uh, achieved, even though I sacrificed my life and I sacrificed my all so that my countrymen and women could live, but there's still a lot to be done. I think um, we, Liberians need to, to, I can't, this is not a, a forum to talk about the situation in Liberia today, that is. I just wanna say that there's a lot, I just wanna stop here and say, there's a lot that needs to be done. Liberia is still in need of help. Yes. Um... Yes, and I think it's important to, to note that after the war ended, there was a lot to do, and we did a lot. Uh, as you say, there were over 100,000 uh, combatants disarmed in Liberia from three separate armies, um, and the UN played the lead role in that, but we were right there. We built the US. I hired a contracting uh, company to build the new police force because the old one was part of the problem. We built lots of institutions. We 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 started to uh, uh, an economy back up. All kinds of things. So you're getting the flavor of of this. And Jenkins was right there on in on all of it. Um, well, and, and that includes the election, by the way, which was which many people didn't want to take place. And so the embassy's view, the embassy's position was to push for the election and not let it slide into some sort of power vacuum. Well. Uh, that takes care of Liberia during the war and ending it and the immediate post-war situation. I wonder, you know, you went through so much, Jenkins. What, what kind of advice in general would you give to young people, uh, young Liberians and, and young people everywhere? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. I just want to dedicate this honor to the memory of all those who lost their lives. And I hope their families can uh, take some consolation in this. And I just want to also dedicate uh, my service to my compatriots back home in Liberia, that uh, young Liberians and even you know, older Liberians should take this as an inspiration that in everything you do, you should commit yourself, be humble, work for your country. I mean, foreigners cannot, outsiders cannot build Liberia. Outsiders cannot fix Liberia. It's Liberians who can, who can build Liberia. We, right. should, uh, we should forget our various political alliances 
politicians will only use us, but we have to look in the neighborhood, the West African neighborhood. We have to look at Ghana. We have to look at Ivory Coast and even uh, 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 Nigeria. They're moving forward, they're making progress. We are stagnated. We need to use this, uh, our, our, our skills, our various skills beyond politics. We should put our country first and help build that country and move that country forward. And I think uh, the second phase of my career is just beginning. I still have much to give, like uh, my, the revered uh, Ambassador Lena Thomas Greenfield said. And I'm going to collab keep collaborating with uh, positive uh, uh, forces, positive people to help my country in any way possible. That's my, my duty, and that's what I'm going to do. Well, well, let me just ask a little bit further. I mean, what's your, you know, about your future? We've talked about your past, but what's next? What do you think's next? Oh, well, uh, I will not let a lot out of, out of the bag right now. Uh, <laughs> okay, <yeah>. I tried. <laughs> but but, but uh, I'm, I'm a student. I'm currently a student uh, at Harvard Kennedy School, uh, so studying for a master's in public administration. And hopefully next year I'll be done with that. Then uh, I will just remain engaged on Liberia affairs and see how I can help my country, you know, make it uh, a place for everyone to live and the national uh, kick should be equally shared and corruption and, 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 and other issues should be tackled. You know, that, that's gonna be my, 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 my call, my next Great. call. Well, uh, Liberia needs you Jenkins, that's for sure. And, Thank um, you. Uh, and so I think this has been a, 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 a wonderful. Let me, let me ask our Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, let me ask Belinda to, to rejoin us and, and take charge of, uh, of questions from the audience. Thank you, thank you, everybody. Great, thank you, Ambassador Blaney. And thank you, Jenkins, for your comments uh, today. I think that was a really meaningful discussion. And Jenkins, you're not able to see it yet, but do know that in our chat, you have an overwhelming number of uh, uh, supporters who are thanking you for your service, who are expressing their pride in all that you did and congratulating you on this great achievement. So I hope that you'll get a chance to reflect on that. Uh, As we kind of move to the question and answer uh, period, I want to encourage everyone to, uh, you know, please do share your um, questions and, uh, and responses in the program chat. And uh, also, I, you know, and I will try to address those as quickly as possible. Uh, let's look, continue to think about the future. And as you reflect on your, uh, you know, tenure at the Harvard Kennedy School and, and noting that uh, President John F. Kennedy uh, did draft, write a book called Profiles in Courage, I'm wondering what, Based on your life experience, how would you define bravery and courage? Well, I think courage and bravery are two separate words, but they, they, they are cousins, you know, I think. Um, bravery is being selfless, dis having disregard for, for your own personal safety and putting other, other, uh, the safety of others first to achieve a goal. And courage is having the will to achieve a goal. So um, I think what I did in Liberia was uh, firstly driven by courage and was assisted by bravery. So I, I used both uh, to achieve what I achieved in Liberia. And at Kennedy School, you know, my favorite quote of, uh, from President Kennedy is, uh, don't ask what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And I know Liberians are not gonna ask me anymore what Liberia can do for me, but now they know what I can do for my country. So it's time for my country to do something for me. And all I ask is for Liberians to put Liberia first and let's help to build that country. That country needs help. Great, thank you, I appreciate that. Also, as, as you kind of reflect on, on the past and, and many of your achievements uh, that you, know, you have uh, accomplished, I'm wondering, how did you overcome these difficult times that you experienced? 
was was there you know how how did you have the resilience and strength to move forward even in these challenging times you know <clears throat> growing up uh as a young as a young boy and seeing your father here at gunpoint and seeing uh, him being nearly shot uh, while your mom and, and siblings watch and seeing um people get killed all because their only crime was because they belong to an ethnic group as, a, as uh, the same ethnic group as, as rebels or people who wanted to make coup. That has been the foundation of, my, of, of who I am today. I've never wanted to see another man get beaten, get shot the way I, mean, I saw my father get, treat, get treated. So that has been the bedrock of my, of my thinking, of my, of, my, of my psyche. I've always thought that I would do everything I can do to prevent uh, another man killing another man because he needs to satisfy his personal agenda. And that has been uh, my drive. And with such a mindset, you cannot have any fear of another man because you have a purpose. Thank you. So you are an excellent model and mentor to uh, many individuals throughout your career. And I, I think many of our participants today are wondering, is there a historical figure or someone in your life who you view as a hero and, and someone that you model your behavior after? Thank you. Well, uh, my late father, he was not uh, well-educated, barely graduated from high school. He's, he's, he's uh, deceased. He, he will always be my hero. But uh, in, outside of that, I look up to peaceful men like uh, Martin Luther King and Nelson Mandela, their message of peace the measures of equality for all men, they are the two most uh, uh, inspiring of, of, of personalities that have uh, always been uh, my heroes. Great, thank you. If there is advice that you could offer to yourself on your first day of working at the U.S. Embassy, what would that advice be? Uh, hit the ground running. You know, get rid of your fears, get rid of your inhibitions, and hit the ground running. Everything you do, put yourself into it. Put your all into it. Don't don't have self doubt because doubting yourself would inhibit every other success and, and that you you stand to achieve. Believe in yourself. You know you can achieve anything you want to be to, to be. I think that's wise advice. You know, I'm wondering. You know, we've talked a little bit about who you admire. We've talked about people who have influenced you. Can you also share a little bit about uh, what are the characteristics that you think that a, a good leader should have? The first characteristic I think a good leader should have is uh, putting the people first. Because when a leader puts the people first, he will work for the people. He will meet the needs of the people. He will understand their feelings. He will understand their situations. He will understand their problems. But if a leader put, puts himself first, then everything goes the other way around. Because a leader should lead his people and not the other way around. So a good leader should always learn to put his people first and be very fair and transparent in everything he does. You know, that, those are my two advices. And I think leaders, African leaders uh, have, have let us down you know, mostly. But again, I'm not here to talk about that. I think the world knows and everybody who's watching and listening you know, to this program knows the problem with Africa has been African leaders. But if only African leaders will put their, their people first, I don't think we'll have most of the problems we have in Africa today. Thank you. We've got a lot of great questions coming from the audience today. One question is, what do you do um, outside of work to maintain your resilience and your sense of self? Do you have hobbies or, or interests that don't relate to your direct work? Oh yeah, uh, uh, back home I always make sure I play uh, football, soccer on weekends. And uh, I, I had, I'm, I'm fond of dogs, so I would play with my dogs a lot and you know, chat with my, with my wife, my beautiful wife. She's sitting over there watching me and, and, and my two teenage, teenage kids. So, but outside of work, I mostly play soccer. I do a lot of uh, fitness uh, exercises and I, I, I like my dogs. 
you definitely have a beautiful family. And, uh, you know, I know that they have also sacrificed a great deal. So thank you from all of us to them as well. So one of the uh, other questions that we have relates to another of your outside interests. Um, there are some that have heard that you are interested in following global affairs and politics. And we're wondering, what are some of your favorite issues or topics to follow and discuss? Well, uh, I've been following, you know, I've been uh, making some, I've been doing some comparative analysis uh, in my spare time with the situation in Afghanistan and a situation in Liberia, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Liberia. And with all fairness, I'm not here to judge the US, uh, uh, the decision of the of US policymakers, but I think that the current situation in, like, in Afghanistan is, I mean, it, it doesn't speak well of, of US uh, 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 decision makers, because if all the money that was spent in Afghanistan, at least a little bit of that money has been spent in countries like Liberia, I think we were being Liberia will be far, far better off than it is now. These are some of the things that I've been looking at. And I've also been looking at uh, the current you know, global issues regarding Russia. Russia is becoming a little bit too aggressive, in my opinion. And I think uh, Russia needs to be stopped in its tracks because they, they are, uh, are, are challenging you know, uh, decent countries and decent policies around the world. I think there's a need for some strong uh, U.S. policy against Russia to stop them in their tracks. And uh, China is also you know, making uh, aggressive uh, moves in the South China Sea. And that needs to be also be you know, put in their tracks because just imagine if China and Russia became, I mean, leaders of the world, just imagine how this world would look. You know? So I think U.S. power should not be uh, paralleled by people like the Chinese and the Russians, and so that the Americans need to, 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 to double it up and put China back where China belongs, and put Russia back where Russia belongs. Thank you. So I have a question from the audience that really takes us back to almost to your origin story, but with the US Embassy. So folks are interested in knowing a little more about what drew you to work at the US Embassy and what factors there, what about the environment there, the people kept you at the embassy for 19 years? Well, uh, you know, I've always been driven by my passion to help my country. And I've, the work, the job I did at the American embassy, it put me in a perfect position to influence things. You know, I was humble, I worked from behind the scenes, but I can credit myself with most of the good things that happen in Liberia today happened because of my intervention, because of my advice. And I was fortunate to have great ambassadors like Ambassador uh, John Blaney, who's, who's, who's here with me today. I was very lucky to have ambassadors like Ambassador Lena Thomas Greenfield, who worked very closely with me. I think it's a great honor for, to have worked on a six different ambassadors and ambassadors of the caliber of uh, Ambassador Lena Thomas Greenfield, Christine and Elder, uh, John Blaney, um, uh, Debbie Malak, I think uh, I was just in a position to help my country and keep pushing. So I felt comfortable from, from where I sat at the embassy to keep influencing policies, decisions, and issues in Liberia. Great, and, and you have had an opportunity to work with uh, just an amazing uh, group of people uh, in uh, Liberia, and that's, that's wonderful. Is there a particular aspect of your job at the embassy that you particularly loved? Well, I love the, 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 the level of respect. And, and, you know, I like to work in an environment where ambassadors will call you my colleague. So that alone makes it feel good that you are part of the team, you belong there, you are worth, you know, the, uh, uh, being there and you are appreciated. So Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield will call me colleague, you know, Ambassador, Debbie Malak will call me colleague. Ambassador Christine Ann Elder, one of my favorites, will call me my, uh, my colleague. And uh, everybody calls, everybody colleagues. There was no you know, uh, bossing uh, around. And that made, made me very comfortable every day I went to work. Even though sometimes we would have not so good you know, uh, uh, staff, but I didn't, I didn't work for them. I worked for my bosses, my supervisors. So I look up to them 
all the time for guardians. And I was very happy to have worked with all of those great people. And they inspired me, they motivated me, they, they, they brought a lot of innovations to me, and they contributed to my, 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 my idea of selflessness and, and integrity, you know. So I'm very happy to, to, have, to have experienced such uh, awesome people. And Brooke de Montlezin, who drafted this nomination, I'm grateful to you. Thank you for, for bringing, uh, making my case forward so that for making this day a, pass, a possible thing to happen. Thank you. We've spent a lot of time today talking about your work experience during the civil war in Liberia. And you've also expressed a lot of pride in your country. For those who, on, who are listening to our talk today who don't know much about Liberia, can you tell us something special about it? Why you love it so much? What makes Liberia so great? You know, Liberia is endowed Liberia is one of the potentially uh, richest countries in the world with a small uh, uh, population. And it's, it's a great place to live. If only the resources will be managed properly, Liberia will be like a heaven you know, on earth. But again, uh, that's why I keep pushing because I want to see Liberia prosperous. I want to see Liberians prosper. I want to see Liberia get developed because the resources are there. It's only the management that is the issue. So Liberia is a very beautiful country in terms of geography, in terms of climate, in terms of food, in terms of the people, in terms of the culture, the tradition. Liberia is, a, is an awesome place. People who served as Peace Corps uh, officers in Liberia before the, the Civil War could not even believe that Liberians would turn uh, against each other at, at the level in which we turn against each other. And if you went back to Liberia today, the camaraderie, the friendship, the, the brotherhood, the, 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 the system is awesome. But I mean, I don't want to blame anyone like uh, calling the name of any specific or particular politician, but politicians have kept Liberia to where it is today. And for Liberia to be at the bottom of the you know, human development index, I think it's a shame. It is a shame. So Jenkins and Ambassador Blaney, before we shift to our closing comments um, and, our, and our final questions, I'd like to offer both of you just a moment or two to share any final thoughts that you might have for the audience. Maybe we'll start uh, Ambassador Blaney with you and then we can uh, give Jenkins the last word before closing things out, thanks. There we go. Well, I would just say that, um, that today has been very special for me and I think uh, worth a worthy event historically because, you know, a lot of this victory, and it's a strange word these days, isn't it, uh, that was achieved in Africa, but really one of the few 21st century victories the United States and others have had, a collective victory, uh, went largely unnoticed. Why? Because all this occurred precisely at the time that Iraq was uh, starting to get going. You remember, for example, uh, President Bush aboard uh, the aircraft carrier with the, with the sign mission accomplished. Do you remember that? And uh, that was exactly the same moment that the war was coming to a climax in Liberia, that's the time we're talking about. So, and also of course, we were heavily engaged in Afghanistan already since the time of 9-11. So that created a lot of, of, of reasons why many in Washington thought we wanted to get ready to celebrate our victories in Afghanistan and Iraq and why they didn't want to deal with what was going on in Liberia and they didn't want a second front and they didn't want the press to even notice it. So this victory, this clear victory, it's now been 18 years since the end of the civil war, a whole generation plus has gone through Liberian peace. They've even survived the terrible Ebola pandemic. And there is a lot to do as Jenkins suggests, but what a tremendous thing. And it, passed largely unnoticed and even um, suffocated. Um, so I thank those and you 
uh, who have brought this story more to life. I think it's a tremendous one for not only the United States, but for the international community, for the United Nations who led so bravely, for our partners in Africa and ECOWAS, for our partners in Europe who helped contribute to all this. And also from all my staff at Embassy Liberia, I will always have, hold a special place, uh, a Liberian or American, we were all one. Thank you. Thank you, Jenkins. I'd like to give the floor to you for your final thoughts. Well, uh, I just want to, you know, say thanks for organizing this this uh, program. This is a such a great honor for me today, and I just want to tell my countrymen who are watching me today that Liberians can achieve great things, and Liberians around the world are doing great things. Let's uh, put our efforts together, put our skills together, and think about what we can do for our country. We, we are great people. We have really smart Liberians who are doing great things around the world. But because of the situation back home, some people don't want to, to even go back home. But I want to encourage you, let's uh, interact, let's, let's compare notes, and let's see what we can do for our country. And to all my former colleagues at the embassy watching, this award is also for you. I mean, we all, we, we, we did this together. I want to, to, to let you know that, you know, this is also uh, for you. And to my close American uh, colleague cycle, I mean, in my American uh, cycle, like uh, uh, Carrie Jas uh, Jaxa, uh, Joshua Delara, and uh, Chris Christine Grauer, and uh, Dante Paradiso, uh, the famous, and many other, I mean, I can't call the names of everybody here. I just appreciate everybody for your friendship, for your guidance and your direction. And most importantly, to my mom, who's back home in Liberia watching, mom, thank you. I'm so proud of you. Thank you. Your words did not go in vain. All your, your struggles did not go in vain. And to my wife and my kids and my dear aunt, I want to say thank you, Auntie Comfort. You are, you, I mean, you are who you are and I am what I am because of you. And to all, every Liberian, I just want to say thank you. You can uh, do what you want to do. You can put your, 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 yourself into what you want to do. And you can achieve great things. Uh, this award should inspire you to let you know that you can do, you can achieve anything you want to achieve if you put yourself into it and work diligently towards it. I just want to thank God Almighty. And I want to thank everyone. I want to thank all my friends. I want to thank the American people for giving me this opportunity to have used you to save my country, men and women. I'm so grateful. I'll always be grateful to you. And I'm happy for this day. Thank you so much. Thank you. And as we prepare to hand the virtual baton back to Ambassador Palaszczuk, I just want to say, thank Jenkins, thank you very much for your service. Congratulations on this great honor. Ambassador Blaney, thank you for all of your words and your leadership during this difficult period. Ambassador Thomas Greenfield, thank you for joining us. And, um, and to our great audience around the world, I appreciate all of your wonderful questions. Thank you. Uh, and now I will hand things over to Ambassador Palaszczuk. Thank you, Dennis Jackson Ferrier. And wow, what a conversation this has been. Um, I, I so deeply admire Jenkins Vangen for everything that he has done. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful to all of our participants in today's session, Ambassador Blaney, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield, and of course, Des uh, Jackson Ferrier, who moderated the discussion. Um, I, I think, uh, Jenkins, you so wonderfully summed up the unique and critical role that our locally employed staff colleagues play in U.S. embassies throughout the world. And it's just remarkable to see how working together, um, a citizen of Liberia contributing to the U.S. embassy team was really able to, to make lasting change that, uh, of course, benefited Liberia, benefited U.S. policy. And that's, that's the unique role of our locally employed staff colleagues. And um, there are many people who do dramatic things as, as you did Jenkins throughout your career in times of great difficulty and a great personal sacrifice. And there are people who do this also in easier circumstances day in and, and day out. And I just, I want to give a tremendous shout out of gratitude to not just you Jenkins, but to all of our locally employed staff colleagues, because you 
you are the, the bedrock of every single U.S. embassy around the world, every single consulate. So thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Jenkins, in particular, for your courage and your bravery. I love the distinction that you made between those two. Um, such inspiring words today. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, this was just so special. Um, for more information about the Heroes at U.S. Diplomacy Initiative, as well as to view video from today's event, please visit state.gov backslash Heroes of U.S. Diplomacy. And also you can follow the hashtag Euro Heroes of U.S. Diplomacy on social media. We'd be grateful if you could please fill out our short audience survey lo located in the chat box. And with that, this concludes today's virtual program. Thank you again to joining, uh, for joining us and congratulations once again to Jenkins. All the best, everyone. Thank you.